نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين قدر من الله مضى فابسم إذا حل القضاء لن يضيق بك الفضاء فالله مولاك المعين قدر من الله مضى فابسم إذا حل القضاء لن يضيق بك الفضاء فالله مولاك المعين الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين انظر بلاء الأنبياء يسمو بهم نحو العلا فبهم يكون الاقتداء نعم الهداة المهتدي انظر بلاء الأنبياء يسمو بهم نحو العلا فبهم يكون الاقتداء نعم الهداة المهتدي الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الله يعلم ما يكون والأمر في كاف ونون فلا تهب ريب المنون واذكر يوافى الصابرون الله يعلم ما يكون والأمر في كاف ونون فلا تهب ريب المنون واذكر يوافى الصابرون الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الصبر نور ويقين لله در الصابرين نعم الأخي ولا تهن أبدا وعزمك لا يلين أبدا وعزمك لا يلين أبدا وعزمك لا يلين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا برد السيسترز السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Welcome to Islamic Voices Online uh, as you know, brothers and sisters, every single uh, Friday evening, 8 p.m., we try to do our best uh, with all the, you know, weather, you know, with all the difficulties sometimes because sometimes we have scholars and humanitarian workers and intellectuals from overseas and they are working in certain places that internet connects or disconnects, things like this. And we bring to you some of the, yani, the best of this ummah, inshallah, is the light ta'ala. And today we have done the same. We bring to you uh, one of the scholars of this ummah, uh, Sheikh Mukasha Muhammad, born in St. Louis, uh, who's a rework, who came to Islam, who became Muslim, who traveled to form to and from the Midwest to East Coast, where he accepted Islam at the age of 24. And shortly after that, he, tra he traveled abroad to seek knowledge of the scholars for many years. Upon his return in 2008, Kasha, Sheikh Kasha underwent eye surgery for a defect at birth. 
Sheikh Ukasha was determined to be legally, uh, he was determ uh, determined at the time that he was legally blind uh, by his care physician, an impending outcome that had, was come, that was to come and uh, became an obstacle, and especially studying overseas. Uh, as many of you know, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, yani, we have many, many, many scholars who, who had either gone blind or were blind. I mean, uh, Imam Bukhari was blind, and subhanAllah, something like this. Imam Suyuti later on became blind in his life, uh, subhanAllah, because of the studying. Uh, Sheikh Ukhasha had to uh, memorize more material than he usually used to because of his deteriorating vision. Going back to review was proving to be harder than his peers may have taken for what they, his peers would have taken uh, for granted. Thus making it of grave importance to Sheikh Ukhasha that he studied and understood what he was being taught. Uh, he has studied in Egypt, in Yemen and uh, Saudi Arabia. He is also the founder of Marquez uh, Safina to Safina to Nuh, inshallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa One second, Shaykh, can you raise the volume over there? So, Shaykh, uh, first of all, uh, yani welcome, uh, Ahlul Musahlan, to the show. Uh, you know, uh, it is a pleasure and honor to have you here uh, with us. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Darakallah fi. Uh, Sheikh, so uh, let's start with uh, you, your background, and Subhanallah, uh, you know, give us a little bit of your journey of, to Islam. I know because I rather I want to go more towards your knowledge, but a little bit just uh, you know how you came to Islam, so we can actually go to the the seeking of knowledge more than how you came to Islam. <laughs> Inshallah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabi al-jama'in wa shahadu an la ilaha illallah Okay, ho uh, Shaykh, it's from your end, we can't hear you Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? Uh, this is a dead end. No, this is. Uh, sorry, brothers and sisters, this is something, uh, you know, this is not in our hands. Sometimes it happens where uh, we experience things. Uh, just give us a little bit, a few minutes, inshallah, we'll be there. Uh, while we are trying to connect this, inshallah, I uh, just want to also uh, give you guys a little bit of background that I, I think that the Sheikh also studied under uh, Sheikh Muqbil um, uh, Al Wadi Al Hadi. I think many of you who know who, who know Yemen uh, and uh, many of you probably do. On, you know, if you know Sheikh Muqbil, uh, even the brother that we were actually uh, we have we recorded, we were talking about the book. Uh, don't forget us here. Many of the brothers. And subhanAllah, we've done a lot of work, have studied under such scholars. So I uh, I really want to get this back to this, inshallah. I have a lot of questions I want to ask.
he, he want to go back and come back in maybe is that us or them it's them right yeah yeah, I can. yeah so we're good it seems uh, You know, they're asking me to talk. I guess we need to talk. No, I want, I want, yani, subhanAllah, let's see. Hmm? Uh, the conference, yes, uh, while we get uh, Sheikh Gukasha back online, inshallah, uh, brothers and sisters, you guys do know that we have a conference coming up, uh, which is uh, the 24th, 25th, and the 26th, inshallah. Uh, inshallah, we'll be, we'll be, we have a lot of scholars coming, bismillah ta'ala, from, uh, from Canada, from Jordan, from uh, many different places in the world. It's both national and international. So try to attend that conference, 24th, 25th, and 26th, inshallah. We are trying to get Sheikh Ushaka Ukasha back, inshallah. Yeah, we need your video on, Sheikh. Not disturbed wasn't on. No okay. It is? Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, if you can move uh, again, uh, yes, there you go. There you go. All right. Say, That's say, good. SubhanAllah. Nah, I'm, so, I'm sorry for the interrupt. Somebody called and then knocked everything out. I'm using my phone. Allah must die. So the, the question you asked me was to talk about like my Islamic journey. How I became a Muslim. Yeah, just a few minutes, maybe one or two, and yeah. but because I really want to go into the to pick your brain on the knowledge part more than even. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah, yes, alhamdulillah. But I don't have a big story, you know, when then in the in the sense of someone like you know told me about Islam. I come from a Christian background, and um, that Christian background was kind of um, a serious background, you know, where we did like read the Bible, go to church. Uh, and try to avoid prohibited things and prayer. And so I was serious about church. And so <clears throat> someone introduced me to a book called Was Jesus Black? And they gave me also a book, The Nation of Islam's leader, Elijah Muhammad, wrote the message to the black man. So I'm reading those books. I learned about the nation of Islam. And then someone came to visit me from the Jehovah Witness. And they gave me this book that had international religions. And so as I'm reading through this book, I see two pages on Al-Islam. And it had a picture of the Kaaba and had some talks about the pillars of Islam, the tenets of faith like this. And so the next step was I left St. Louis going to the East Coast. And one of my friends, he told me, he said, when you go to the East Coast, you're going to see the real brothers. But he was referring to real Muslims and not people from the Nation of Islam. So shortly after that, I went to a local masjid in Newark, and the imam was from Egypt. He invited me to Islam, but I wasn't really ready because I needed more information. So I got some books from him I read. And then I had an elder cousin. He was the, my, my, my grandmother on my mom's side had a sister who had a son. And this was an elderly cousin, like 64. So he died of a heart attack. And I went back to St. Louis for the janazah. And so I met my mom's house. I have the dream that I'm standing up. I'm talking to people, but there's no sound in the dream, like an audio. It's broken, but you see the picture. And people were sitting down low. And when I woke up, my heart was trembling and my body was trembling, you know, with some reason of fear behind what's in the dream. So I said, when I go back to New Jersey, I'm going to go back to that imam and ask him, what does this dream mean? So when I went back to him, I told him about the dream and he looked at me and he said, in the dream, you were imam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command you to accept Islam. And um, I cried, I took Shahada and 
he became my first teacher and I never looked back. Subhanallah. How old were you, Sheikh, when you came to Islam? Uh, 24. 24 years old. And then, yeah. uh, so this uh, takes you to journey, uh, and you, this is a whole new beginning, and yani now it takes you to journey to to, to studying. I mean, you, you studied under Sheikh Mokbil, is this correct? Yes, I studied under Sheikh Mokbil bin Had in Wadayu, rahimahullah ta'ala, but I had many other teachers besides him, some bigger than him, some smaller, but the real point should be that I started in America, learning Arabic, learning uh -huh. how to uh, recite the Quran, learning basic Islam. As most of the ulama, they tell you to exhaust the knowledge locally before you go outside your locale. And uh -huh. then the people, they seen something in me that they encouraged me to go abroad, to get the language, you're young. And um, so I went, but I started at home. By the time I went to Egypt in 90, well, after making Hajj in 95, then in 97, I went to Egypt. I already knew how to speak some Arabic and books. And so, you know, I had a good start, you know, before I um, dipped my foot in the ocean, you know, so to speak. Alhamdulillah. Ah, subhanAllah. So, uh, you got, now you are, uh, I mean, East Coast has a whole history of, <laughs> it, it has, <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I don't know if you want to delve into that, but you know. Hey, uh, my skin is tough, you know, and <laughs> I, I, you know? I have my, I have, I have my, you know, people that love me, and friend, families, and as they say, haters, you know, and enemies, you know, so it's okay. No, 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 no. I, I, I meant to say, you know, it, you know, that used to be the, the hardcore brothers and, you know, all kinds of stuff going on and. What is it now? I mean, how 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 have things changed, and uh, what do you think w w was the reasons for this? Especially being a person of knowledge and understanding, uh, what did you, you know, uh, how did you navigate through all of this, being a scholar? Allah mustan. And the first thing I want to say is that <sighs> our mother Aisha Allahu Taala Anha, she said, "Raham Allahu." Man Arafa Qadrahu or Kama He said, if Salah mentioned this, may Allah have mercy on the one who knows his place. And I less to be Alamin Yani Wala Yani Shaykhun Kabir Wala Alali Yani less to be Tawaybil Ilm. When a Salah yet the Kabbal Mini when you listen to me, they pull the Korval Amal. Nan. So that's the first thing. I'm not a scholar. I may not even be a small stu a miniature student, you know, but I ask Allah to give me sincerity and truthfulness in what I have. That's I mean, the first I mean, thing. I mean, Sheikh, I mean. Yeah. And yani, Sheikh, yani, as we mentioned to the brothers before, Sheikh has many meanings. One of them, Dhul Il, the one who has some Il. And a, a young boy can be nine years old and be Sheikh. And back in the time of the Prophet, those people, yani, Ladina Hafid Surat al Bakra, Yani Kanu Yani Marufan be Yani Ahlul Il with Khuluk, you know, then then the, the, the Prophet Salam, if someone memorized Surah Al Baqarah, of course they memorized each ayah and they practiced it before they went to the next, but they were considered like yani, scholars. In the time of Imam Shokani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, they said the one who's considered if he memorized yani, three Jews of Quran, Surah Al Baqarah. So, you know, for us, we always think the person has to tabah, yani, tabah il. He has to have an ocean of knowledge, you know, to be Sheikh. No, you couldn't be Sheikh without that. But, Alam, Yani, our Rabbani min al Ulama, Yani, Naruju, inshallah, Yom and Ayyam, and Nakun Minhum. We hope one day we reach that level. I mean, that's for the issue. Yani, uh, of seeking ilm and going. I mean, early on, you know, when you talk about this issue, well, Tabaraku wa Ta'ala mentioned, Ya ayu ladina amanu, udukhulu fi silmi kafah, into Islam, or you believe, you know, kafah, and mujahid, he said, kafah means jami'an, enter, yani, totally, with everything. 
And the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he mentioned, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqunakum min dhikrin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilin li ta'arafu, inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum, inna allaha aliyun khabir. When we hear the likes of those ayah, for us being African American, we understand that's like Bilal on the day of Fatah al Mecca being on top of the Kaaba. And the uh, Tafsir, when he was calling the Adhan, some of those Arabs, they were making statements. It's in the narrations, the Sahih. One of them said, I'm glad my father died and he didn't live to see the day when this mm -hmm. black crow would be standing on top of the Kaaba. Another one said, Woe to us that we're witnessing this black piece of trash on the house of Allah. So for us, we understand racism is still here. And for us, we're always as a people who are the people that their forefathers were brought to this country. Many of them were Muslim. And we still, after all of that, try to find our way, we still need someone who looks like us. We still need someone we can identify that that person is upon Islam, Quran and Sunnah. So during that time, we're going through a, a period of transition. And uh, when the Imam Abu Muslima, that most people know, when that issue happened with him and Sheikh Rabia, mm. that had at Madkhali, it was an in-house issue with brothers from our community that wanted to bring him down. And so that issue, that event, forced a lot of people to go study because we didn't know what to do. We didn't know, stay with our Imam, follow him, we know him, or go with Sheikh Rabia, which we didn't know who he was from a can of paint. And most of us didn't care, but because the issue of you know, respecting scholarship and they raised him too. He's from the major scholars. Some of us said we have to go learn, you know, because if we stay like this, each time the trick comes, we're going to be tricked. And so, how did you become like this, Sheikh? Yani, especially, you know, uh, yeah, this is amazing to see uh, the knowledge, mashallah. I mean, I can see the learning that you have just by a you know, few minutes of uh, yani, talking to you. Uh, you know, this the love for learning where did it come from well like the love for learning i'm going to have to say to be honest with you a sheikh on the book rahimahullah used to say and i reference him the most because he's in his places where i spent the most time the sheikh used to say laysa min quwwatina wala min katrat al-ilmina wala min Shaja'atina, lakin hadha shay'un arad Allahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sheikh, he never took credit. He said, what we achieve is not because of, you know, who we know or how much intelligence or how much knowledge or, you know, our abilities. He said, no, this is something Allah himself by himself wanted to do and he did it. As for personality, then, you know, I've always been a person that if I'm going to be serious about something, I try to do my best. And being the third of five children, and, and coming from a situation where uh, my father was not around, uh, being, you know, that those men in the African American community in the 60s and 70s, you know, most of them were bank robbers you know, mm -hmm. trying to feed their families, you know, because the government themselves gave our mother's choices. They said, listen, you know, we'll give you housing, we'll give you um, food vouchers, you know, because we were in a situation where blacks really didn't have. So the government said, you know, you can apply, we'll give you housing. As citizens, we, we have to do this for you, but in one condition, no men in the house. So that mean your father, can't be in the house. And they will actually come and check to see if there's shoes under the bed that look like men's shoes, they would look in the closet. And if they found that, then the good housing that we had because of our economic situation, they were taken. 
the monies they gave the mothers with children, they were taken. So many of our fathers, the only thing was left for them was to sell drugs. They didn't want to sell drugs or to rob banks or post offices. So my father was one of those. And even just like yesterday, I have an older brother. He's two years older than me. I was blessed to give him Shahada back in 94. And now he's really a Muslim. He prayed fast. He told me, he said, we have a picture and our father signed it way back in the 80s, his name Wali. So he hmm. was really a Muslim, you know, subhanAllah, you know. And so my point is that there's something in our DNA, you know, to love goodness, to be fighters. You know, my mom was like, you know, a warrior when it comes to being an activist for her children to get housing or any type of thing that you know, you can think of, she's on the front line, you know, dealing with this um, issue in the society about black people, you know. So for us, when you talk about personalities, many of us already come to Islam with these type of personalities because of what we went through, what we've seen our mothers go through, our fathers, our grandmothers, our aunts, you know. And, in, and, and, and the Islam just enhances that if we're sincere. So, Sheikh, let me ask you this. This is a... Uh, I mean... Subhanallah, yani really, Jazakallah khair for being on the show because this is really um, yani eye-opening also for me. And I've, I've read a lot of history on the black, uh, you know, especially African-American Islam in, in this country. But, Sheikh, you know, this is a question I usually ask even a lot of the brothers who come on the show who are African-American. Yani what is your understanding of the connection of the Muslims here today uh, with the uh, you think is it necessary for the Muslims, especially African Americans, to have connection to uh, to Africa and the scholars of Africa and to uh, yani, uh, the way you were able to connect to the Muslim world? How important is that? Is it necessary or is it? You know, what is your thoughts on that? You know, the issue of seeking knowledge, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentioned it is even in the light of differentiating between one dog over another dog. Talking about the the, the hunting dog. And Shaykh Mughbil, he used this rahimahullah, this ayah in Surah Al Ma'ida to say, and Allah ha and Allah ta'ala yafadilu kelbin alim Jahil. So the law preferred the dog who has ill over the dog who's ignorant. Well, you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hal yastu wa ladina ya'alamuna wa ladina la ya'alamun. Bala. And when Allah asks these questions, really it's istinkar wa yani tawbiq li hadha shay. Yani ayat sawwi hadha bihadha it's allah really showing you the disdain for even trying to make these two things equal so of course the one who doesn't have knowledge is not like the one who has knowledge is the one who can see like the one who's blind well the one who is deaf is not like the one who can hear so for us, you know, when we talk about this issue, we have to seek in. And that's a problem when we talk about all of the Muslims, whether it be us, African-American, Latino, you know, Caucasian, in this day and time, you know, any people you name uh, from uh, West Africa, you know, whether it be Senegal or the Gambia or Ghana, or we take the northern parts of Africa, like Maghreb, Morocco, and Yani Libya and Tunisia, or if you take South Africa, Yani Johannesburg, and or you take those eastern parts like Yani Habashia, Ethiopia, or Tanzania, T Tanzania, doesn't make a difference. The, ilm, the, ilm, the knowledge is the knowledge. But the problem is when you have this knowledge that the Prophet he mentioned. Whoever Allah, he wants, intends good for that person, he will give them an understanding of the deen. Some of the scholars said, 
يعني إدراك والعمل ثق here means knowledge and action together that's why the prophet used the word fiqh and he didn't say Allah will teach him la yani qala nabi yufaqahu min fahima naam tafhiman Allah will give him fiqh here yani karran al-ilm majrat al-ilm bil-amal that the literal knowledge that you gain is coupled with the action fruits of that knowledge so for us we have to have that so whether you go outside the country whether you go to africa you go to asia this is imperative you know and this will be a virtuous thing until the day of judgment but we will also say that allah has blessed us he has given us more avenues so it's not such a necessity because we have a lot of people in america here they are lie on the level of scholars we know that you know we have them here problema here so why travel somewhere you know except you want to be in an environment that's more islamic if we can say that or a place where the submersion and the language will help you but to have that which every muslim needs to worship allah you don't have to take that money get on a plane be away from your food your drink your loved ones you don't have to do that So that's the first thing I would say in my estimation. The second thing is that the knowledge has to be something that's different now than it was in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s and the 60s. And what I mean by that is people become bored with the knowledge because of technology, because of the you know, um, transition of how the youth, they have a different level of knowledge now you find the youth with master's degrees phd's and you have to the quran or the matun but you go back 20 30 years ago the youth had six months in egypt you know uh, maybe a year and a half from here um, if they graduated from a two pro, pro, two year program or a master's degree it was a big thing so all of this makes it more challenging for us when it comes to it and the environments are worse now yeah, I mean, all of the places yeah, I mean, are polluted with the same type of evil just the levels of them are different because of the societies but with the uh, passing of the satellite dish which used to be the thing now you have internet and everyone has a device be a poor rich middle class or you know low class then you know the challenge is almost the same except that the uh, level of it may vary from place to place so you know we we are more in need of the knowledge and the action in this day and time that we probably ever were but the way that that knowledge is gained and the way that it's given i would say uh, presents some very different ways and challenges but we have to do it we have to do it Here, here's the thing well you know if you look at i guess you know what i was you know many of them you know, when the brothers they come into islam especially african-americans uh, yes. you know, many of them came through um uh, you know nation of islam and it was uh, you know at the time you had uh, at least the 60s or 70s you had you know the, the black uh, 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 the nation of Islam and, and then the, the Black Panthers and mm-hmm. and it was it seemed though that you know when they came and it was people actually they, they seemed they wanted genuine change they really wanted to stand up somehow against what was happening in society and it, today you know we don't have nothing has really changed right we see still see the same type of oppression either it's from so many different levels but do you see that the, when the Muslims who are coming in, whether they're African Americans or Caucasian, doesn't really matter, are they coming in? Of course, both are coming in for different reasons, you know, for whatever background that they had. But do you see that Islam is looked upon the same way, uh, or is it is it different? That you know, the, the 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 reasons for accepting Islam, you know, at one point it was that Islam would give us the backbone against oppression but today it's more 
I guess that's what I'm asking. I mean, is it has it changed the way the brothers or people come into Islam? Well, the way that the people view Islam and its effects and what you asked me before you got to that point of the question about um, the people themselves, you know, why they came to Islam 20, 30 years ago in the black community versus today. And, you know, why does things still seem the same? Nothing has changed. How do we, you know, look at the Islam? How do the people look at the Islam who are the non-Muslims as well? The first thing I'm going to say is it, it is different. Because as you mentioned, you know, that's a certain generation that came to Islam through the Nation of Islam and the War of Deen um, community. That's a certain generation came to Islam through the Black Panther movement, through the Dar Islam movement, they call the Dar, through the Deen Allah uh, movement with the uh, Sheikh Hisham Jabba, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, you know, the Jamaat Tabligh, mm -hmm. the Sufi, the Quran, all, all of those places in the books that we read and they were here. But for us, it's the same thing that we witness when they put their video out about the death of George Floyd. The reality of what we were dealing with was covered up with, you know, a good economy and mm. time to change and being able to have freedom of religion. But the racism was still here. It's still here, you know. So when you talk about back then, yeah, people, they were just trying to proceed through the death of Malcolm, the death of you know, Martin Luther King, the death of all of those other people that killed and took the win out of the people, took the fight out of the people. You know, similarly with us, you know, we went through so many changes, you know, those later generations that accepted Islam that, they said in the beginning orthodox islam then they said sunni islam then in the era of imam al-albani they said the dawah to salafiyah then after that when he died and sheikh ben Bas died and sheikh jose Min died and sheikh Mukbil died then they said <coughs> salafiyah by the way did you, were okay. you were, did you ever study again under sheikh jose Min? La, 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 abadan, abadan. but don't lose the point the point <laughs> is that now people say what happened you guys were in your glory in the 90s. Salafia was spreading all over America and Great Britain and Canada. Even when we talk about the legacies of Islam in America, how African-Americans, they had the masajid. They may have been storefront. They may have been leaking from the roof. They may have been, you know, small, but we had them. When the foreigners came, they had to come in our communities and assimilate. But they mm -hmm. said, what happened? Because we said that's history that you guys want to erase. Now you want to talk about the Islamic center of this place and that place, which is, you know, two, three point million dollars. But the Islam didn't start in the city of Philadelphia there. The Islam in the city of Newark didn't start there. The Islam in the city of Baltimore didn't start there. It started with African Americans with small facilities. How can we erase that history and be truthful? The point and what they say is, okay, some recognize that when we bring it up and others try to act or maybe they don't recognize it but they ask the same question you said what happened what happened is this the people kept going through defeat from the outside of the african-american community as well as inside and if you beat a person if you knock the air out of a person if you step on a person long enough you're gonna knock the fight out of them. Mm. You're gonna knock the fight out of them. And we, to this day, the African-Americans, we feel marginalized. When you go in the masjid, especially if you don't know Arabic, the people that speak in Arabic, maybe they look up at you. You know, they were speaking English at first. You come in the door, they look at you, they switch to Arabic, and then they look at you, and then they laugh. I think we feel racism. If you want to marry a man's daughter, to praise you, you're an engineer, you have no criminal background record, never been in the penitentiary, you're not a person on drugs, you have a family that's, uh, you know, uh, respectable in the community. But if you ask for the daughter of that Pakistani, 
if you ask for the daughter of that Arab. Sometimes, mostly, if you ask for the daughter of that African, they're going to tell you no. Why? Because this issue hasn't went anywhere. So this is one of the things that when people say what happened, you know, why is it still the same or why is it worse? Because the condition hasn't changed between us and those people. And now we're Muslim. We dealt with this with white America. We dealt with this with our own people, black on black crime and self-hatred. Now we're Muslim and we have to deal with this in the Ummah. So when the people say what happened, you know, subhanAllah, if they really want to know, some people are going to have to make some changes when we give that answer. Some people are going to have to make some toba when we give that answer. Some people are going to be, have to be ready to commit to really make some change because that's what has not happened. We haven't made any changes. Hmm. Yeah, and this is a, a no, no, continue, Sheikh. I mean, as, as far as, you know, racism, uh, obviously, uh, racism uh, within this country or I'm going to come back to this point, but when you went to study overseas, did you ever feel that? I mean, you know, there was a brother on a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, actually, we were discussing this issue of racism, uh, and he was an Arabi brother, and uh, he said, oh, there is no such thing as uh, racism in uh, in the Arab community, uh, you know, if they have studied and things like this. Well, like, you asked me this question, want to be truthful with you. Yeah, yeah, I want about you racism. To... Yeah, yeah right. and, and I'm not saying. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying because some people, when we say be truthful, what I mean, I'm gonna do anything less than that. But some people, they they would would withhold. They want not answer, but they know that there's another side. Like mm -hmm. for example, I'm gonna give this guy the benefit of the doubt. This app said there's no racism in the Muslim countries and the Muslim areas, and when people study. But the whole world has been colonialized. Everybody looks at the African Americans, excuse my French, the way white people look at us, niggers. And when you're overseas, unless you want a place like Damaj, Yemen, Sana'a, Ma'bar, Hudayda, Aden, mm. where the Prophet praised these Yemeni people. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ talked yeah, about their, 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 their hearts, Akhi. The Prophet ﷺ talked about their iman, you know, what hikmat al imaniya. That hasn't went anywhere when you talk about the general society of Yemenis, no matter where they live. So, yeah, we could go and marry from amongst them. Yeah, we didn't see much racism with them, but you can best believe if you had a light skinned Yemeni, he's I mean, she's the woman, and the man is Yemeni. He's dark, dark skin. You know, like uh, Sammy Davis Jr. or uh, uh, like Bar Barack Obama. Everybody knows Barack. You will find that light skin Arab lady saying about her husband, "Who a qabih, who a aswad, who a kelme muna." Who he's like a monkey. He's ugly. He's black. And sometimes they forget, like, we know Arabic, we live with them, we sit, but, you know, we, we, you hear this. And when they have the marriage, no matter if the lady's brown or red or white or dark skin, they have a custom, most of the Arabs today, even in Yemen, they had this. They make her put this white stuff on her face and they sing a song, and they, what is better than the white bride? What is better? Are you serious? This is racism. You see what I'm saying? But people in denial about this issue because it hurts. Again, if we acknowledge it, we got to do something to it. Because Allah said, Inna akramakum inda Allah ma'adha atqaqum. This is, this is the true essence of racism. Anna khayru minkum khalaqani min narun wa khalaqatahu min teen. That's the Iblis. Iblis. Kalam Iblis. Created me from fire. Created him from mud. So that's the real deal. But yeah, I mean, even some brothers they experienced in Saudi Arabia. You know what I'm saying? The darker guy, you, you think he's Arab, he looks Saudi, but he gets treated a certain way. If the other guy is light skinned, he gets treated a certain way. And if he doesn't get treated a certain way, it's only because they respect the knowledge and ain't nothing they can do about that. But the racism 
and it's, it's okay. real. Let's let's let's. This is okay. This is a very interesting point that you mentioned. They do force them to respect your knowledge. But here's the point. That's the I, I, you know. I guess I, what I want to get to is that, Sheikh, is this a way? You know, I'll give you an example. For instance, back in India, I'm from India, so yes, yes. And uh, and, and back in India, you know, we especially being treated the way they treated us in India, especially between the Hindus and the Muslims and stuff like this. A lot of the brothers in India, they went out to study. They, they the only way out was education. There was no other way. So till today, you see that thing where education is like the 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 the, the everything. And you have to study that even if you're dying, you know, because that was the only way out. So you had to study. You just had to study because that was the only way you could get some type of, uh, 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 you know, respect and dignity and a way out. Let's put it this way. So yes. is this something that we need to push within the communities, whether they're black communities, brown communities, whatever it is, that the only way that uh, you will be respected or we will be respected is that we need to do everything possible to 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 make knowledge you know the 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 primary concern that is the only way to gain let's say respect in this world today and that is the dean of the yeah, dean of well, allah no. i mean especially in, essence, in the inner city, especially in the inner city because you know in inner city as you know the situation especially of education in the inner city you know i've worked in inner city 14 years 15 years and you know, it's it was always about zakah, for instance. Like many times, we tried very hard to try to you know work in the inner city and 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 work especially on the education side. And by Allah, Sheikh, to tell you the truth, it was always people would come. They would just want that check of zakah. Once they get that zakah, they're gone. They won't see you until the next month when they need to get that check again. How do we change this this mindset of seeking knowledge and understanding and gaining? How do we do that? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is that. Yes, we should be pushing the issue of education as a priority over everything because Allah wa Taala said, Allah has mentioned that the knowledge raises you. Yeah. So Salam, he mentioned, يعني, in 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 Allah in 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 Allah will raise the people by this book and debase others by it at yeah. the same time. So from Salam, he said, the Quran, Hujjatun Laka Alaik. Allah Mustan. Quran will be in your favor against you. From Salam, he said, Khairukum Man, Ta'alam al Quran, wa Alamahu. The best of you, those who teach the Quran after they learn it. But the issue is deeper than that because just like the brothers, they say, go seek knowledge. Well, I, I experienced, if you go somewhere to seek knowledge, you get homesick, mm. you get physically sick, you get mentally depressed, yeah. your whole issue of talib ilm is over, you're going to shut down. Mm. So that whole idea of seeking knowledge, seeking knowledge, seeking knowledge, without, you know, understanding why you're going to seek the knowledge, that whole issue of seeking knowledge without a purpose. The whole issue of seeking knowledge and not understanding who you're going to come back to with that knowledge to benefit, those days are over. You know, we did that, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. And now when you talk about people just come to the masjid for sakat, but they won't come for a class. Again, because people have so much, what we will have to say, mental illness. Mm. And, the, and, and, and as it relates to depression, anxiety and you know schizo and and brother said well how can you say that we have the quran and sunni Akhi, what quran are you reading well tabarak wa ta'ala mentioned like surah al-duha and surah and shirak and you know all of these different surah full of things to bring a person out of um, severe depression of salam used to make dua against uh, it doesn't mean you can't be sad and you won't be sad. It doesn't mean you know you'll always be happy, but to the point that something that happened in your past, you can't shake that thing, and it impedes you know your progress. To the point that something's in front of you, and you anticipate, what if that happens? What if this doesn't go right? And it affects you. It it, it inhibits you from you know your everyday life, your everyday function. 
subhanAllah, prohibited. And so you're talking about a people that, I remember one time we were, we went to St. Louis, and Sheikh Salim and Ta'weel came to St. Louis. And um, one of the brothers said, you know, Sheikh, we have like a poor community. People come for uh, the sadaqah, and we don't have anything to give them. What should we do? The Sheikh, he said, tell them you're poor and give them the tawheed. But like, is that practical when somebody is coming with an eviction notice? Is that practical when someone's lights just got cut off? Is that practical, Akhi, when people, you know, don't have food to eat because they sold their food for drugs? It's not practical. You see what I'm saying? So we have to deal with social issues, economical issues. We have to deal with issues of suicide, homicide right now. We got Muslims that we may have just talked them and, and de-escalated a real live possible suicide uh, 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 attempt on their own lives because of something they're going through. You know, let me ask you this. Are we living in a bubble? And he, uh, when I ask you these questions also, I just want to make sure, you know, I yeah. want to, and he put me in my place if you have to. There's no, you know, there's no barrier here. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm your student. But I'm asking, you know, are we living in a bubble that sometimes we don't understand the situations that people are coming, coming through, uh, you know, not, not understanding the people. How much does that, how, how much of a hurdle does that become, Sheikh, when you don't understand the people you're dealing with? And then the only thing, let's say we're talking about is uh, we, we're not in the struggle of the people. We just want to give them some knowledge and it makes no sense because we don't understand the struggles. The Prophet ﷺ, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he mentions the issue of yani, um, uh, 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 those people of understanding. The Prophet yeah. ﷺ, he mentioned yani, hadithu, yani, nas ala speak to the people on the level of intellect that they understand. al tabaraku wa ta'ala didn't send yani, Rusul and Qat, except he sent them with Sani Qomihim. So we have to understand that that's the first line of problem that we're not reaching the people because we don't understand what's happening in the lives of the people. And for some people, they don't care, you know, because the people will say, well, for example, I came from Palestine. I had nothing. Now I have two convenience stores, I have a house. I have, you know, Mercedes Benz, I have this, that. You here all your life, you have nothing. But Ahi, when those people came here in the early 1900s from the different countries, they were allowed by the Supreme Court to write down on the immigration paper that they were white Caucasian. Do you know what type of uh, uh, privilege, when we talk about white privilege that gives someone who's Jordanian? But his mm -hmm. hair is slicked back with no beard and he can pass for some type of level of being a human being. Do we know what type of privilege that is for someone who's Syrian or someone who's Bosnian or someone who may even be, like we said, from Pakistan and India that can pass? Then when the civil rights movement jumped off and we gained affirmative action and these things for the minorities, guess what? Then we had to come and say, okay, khalas, we're minorities. So to get free education, tax-free, you get all of the things that was supposed to be for us, the minorities, we don't get it, they get it. But these same people say, you black people are lazy, we don't want nothing, you know, all you like is crime and this and that. It's not always true. You can't just take a brush and paint Why? So I'm saying that to say, when you go back to these people who, you know, don't understand, Sometimes they don't want to understand. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, if you take the average person who's selling drugs in the mm -hmm. inner cities, and now you have, unfortunately, Muslims from Yemen, Syria, uh, Pakistan, they in, the, they, they, they in the inner cities hustling drugs, using drugs, dealing with prostitutes. You know, we know this is the case. They come to us, you know, some of them, for Rukia because they feel I have a gin, someone put this, uh, I, you know, I need to go to rehab. It, it's real. But what's my point? Those people that are in that situation, 
they never get the same stereotype that African Americans get when they go to jail, when they get drug out on drugs, when they, you know, um, deal with the prostitute, when they when they live this evil life. They never get the same stigmatism. But us, right away, we get that stigmatism. So yes, you know, this is something that people are living in a bubble when they think that this is just how it is and it's one way. And if you if you take the average person that He's selling drugs. Most people, they're only selling drugs because I can't go to McDonald's and get a job for $12, $10 and pay rent, pay lights, take care of the children's clothes and medical needs. But if I'm making a thousand dollars a day, hey, I can do what I need to do. You know, so it's the mindset. And if you give that person a $50,000 job, $40,000 job, most of the people we ask, they won't sell no drugs. They won't be in the type of lifestyle that we see them in, but you know, they have no options. So that's what we're dealing with, you know, and yeah, you know, the Sheikh said, just give them the Tawheed. And a part of the Tawheed that we weren't taught, that we learned about now, is that knowing yourself is part of the Tawheed. You mm-hmm. can't say, I, I yeah, know Allah, he's Rabbul Samawati wa Ar, yani wa huwa khalik al Amr, He's the one who controls the affairs. I know his names and attributes. I worship him alone. If you don't know yourself, then you don't know the Tawheed. You have to know yourself as a servant. So let me ask you this. Tawheed. You know, we have a teacher here sometimes. What, what The first thing that he does when we start, let's say, teaching Aqidah, one of the things he does is that he, he first, he actually discusses the, you know, what is human beings made, who are human beings? Right when it comes to you know organic needs and when it comes to instincts, how human beings behave, why do they behave the way they do? Uh, these are the first things that they usually cover. Do you agree with this that this should be the first ones they cover so people understand what we're dealing with? I think that's a good method. I won't say it should be the first, and I won't say that um, it shouldn't be the first, but it should be inclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Salam, he mentioned Aloma Anta Rabbi La Ilaha Illa Anta. This, Allah Musta'an, saying, Allah, you are my Lord, you created me, I am your servant, you know. To the end of this hadith, the Prophet mentioning is showing you we have to know who we are to even know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And you can't know who Allah is and be deficient in knowing about who the human is because again, we're talking about self-esteem, low Mm self-esteem, high self-esteem. You can be so depressed as one of my backgrounds is dealing with substance abuse and mental health. You can be so depressed that you cannot get out of bed to pray and you heard the around in the karma. And somebody else might look and say, oh man, subhanAllah, he's lazy. This is hypocrisy. You can love Allah and his messenger to a live, 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 high degree. But if you are severely depressed, well, you can't function. You can't eat. You can't drink. You can't have sex. You can't pray. SubhanAllah. So I mean, you know, are, this is a real life issue. You, know? you have to deal with the human condition. Is that yes. what you're saying? I mean, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Sheikh, I mean, yes. let me ask you this. You know, we had I gave a khutbah today, and uh, you know, my khutbah was was about uh, yani how what is happening with the Muslim youth today. Uh, you know, we have so called Christian uh, atheists now. I was, you know, it was in uh, uh, Telegraph. I I mentioned this the Telegraph today, the, the English newspaper in England said mm-hmm. almost fifty percent of the the Christians are atheists. But they call themselves Christian atheists because they like the values. But uh, as far as the core believes, they, 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 they're not satisfied with that. Do you, you know, fine. Are you, I mean, do you think that the Muslims, black, white, brown, green, whatever, because now we're dealing with the following generations. It yes. was no longer the guy came in 60s or 50s. Now yeah. we're dealing with you know generations born or maybe second, third generations. Yes. And they're nothing like their forefathers. They're nothing like their fathers, their parents. Right. 
they are completely either American or worse uh, when yes. it comes to uh, dealing, uh, you know, understanding things. There is no understanding, yeah. period. So are we, is this, uh, I mean, the, whatever it is that the African Americans are going through, is this now, we are going to go through the same? Uh, because, you know, it, it, the, 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 the immigrants, when they came, they came with a certain push. I just got to make money. I got to send back home, you know, money back home. I just got to get my sister married, this, that, and the other. They had that push. But you look at the ch children today, the kids, they have no none of that. And they don't have that drive. What I'm trying to say is that now we are, uh, you know, what's happening? Is this generation finally seeing what others have gone through and now they can't you see what I'm asking, kind of. Powerful, uh, powerful, powerful. And I could tell you, Bell, who are the man, all shape. No way, they'll never be like the African American. Mm. But we're in the last days. That's the first thing. The second thing is that with all of the tools we have and all of the uh, things we have been through, we find the African Americans still pushing through. You'll find African Americans. The struggles, the struggles are totally the, different. The, the struggles yeah, yeah, are different. you know, yeah. But but the point is that no matter what we've gone through as a people, we still have the tenacity and the desire in general to do right and mm. to mm. worship Allah and let yeah. nothing yeah. deter us from that. You know, mm. and that and that's one of the the things about us genetically you know this but, is a big on, part on the of, other hand yeah. we, are, we are losing our religion yeah yeah but but wait a minute but wait a minute, but, but stay with me don't get sidetracked i want gotcha, you to yeah. understand because we're gotcha, talking gotcha. about african-american but we're talking about in general mm. so yes this then, is yeah yeah and you know no matter what this country when they see us they say negroes mm. they don't say african-american muslim they see us as Negroes, and then they see the Arabs, the Indians, or the Asians, the Africans, then they see them as Muslims. Hmm. So when you talk about politically, they will never see us as anything in this country except African Americans. So that fight is going to be with us to Yom Piyama. That's a different fight. If someone comes here as a minority and they go through things that's similar to us, still, they will never be able to foot that bill of over 400 years or yeah. the effects yeah. of slavery that we're going to just keep going perpetually because you guys know your fathers and your father's fathers and your father's father's father and your mother's mother and your mother's mother's mother. Allah Tabaraku wa ta'ala said in Surah Bakra, Alladina yan kaduna. <clears throat> Those people, yani, min those who broke the covenant of Allah, the promise that they gave to do certain things with Allah, those who threw away the responsibility that Allah told them to uphold, and they broke the family ties, thus. This is the thing that made all the problems, sin, and corruption in the land. So that's us. You will never be able to replace that, although people come and they're minorities and they go through stuff. But I will say that one of the problems is that similarly, we, the parents of those children that you're talking about, we failed in our own personal Islam some kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't see from us 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the Islam that cultivated a love for them with their Islam now. That's yeah. one of the things that we're dealing with. The second thing, they're in a whole different generation. Can yeah. you imagine, like, you know, having sex in the schools and gang fighting in the school and Everywhere you go, you're dealing with a device and anything you want is at your fingertips. We didn't have to worry about that type of discipline when we were coming up. And those children didn't have to worry about that when they were coming up who were our children. Now that they've grown, they have to worry about that. And then those that are coming now that we didn't raise, they're the children of our children. They have to worry about that. 
So they have a whole set of shayateen to deal with that we didn't have to deal with. Hmm. And 9-11 was a primer for people to do just what you said. The Christians are Christian atheists. Well, you got some Muslim atheists. Muslim by name, but he doesn't believe in the five pillars. Muslim by name, but he doesn't believe he has to pray. Muslim by name, but he doesn't believe in the Jannah and the Nara. Muslim by name, he prefers the Constitution and this and that over anything that's Islamic. That's a Muslim <laughs> atheist. We call them that in English. They are the Munafiqeen in Arabic. You throw Islam or you betin al kufr they display Islam inside the disbelief. And it has bred the likes of those people in Al-Medina because they can hide. Mm. You could be Muslim in America and, and, you know, don't pray or don't do Ramadan. You know, I'm a Muslim. You know, I mean, just by statement. But back home, maybe you couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, this is the trend. And, you know, Rosella mentioned we will follow the ways of those people, the nations before us. Well, guess what? That yeah. prophecy has come to life. Allah Mustan. Allah Mustan. We have a few minutes, but I, I, I have very uh, some crucial questions to ask. But uh, before I go to the questions, one more uh, one more thing, Shekhi. You know, uh, I was no. talking to one other brother the other day uh, from Yemen. And uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you know Mansoor al Udayfi. Uh, do you know who that is? No, I don't know. Uh, he he wrote a book. Uh, he was actually in Guantanamo for 14 years, uh, the brother. Uh, and uh -huh. uh, he. So we we were uh, we did a recording with him. Inshallah, we'll be putting that up very soon. Inshallah. And he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a book uh, on on his experience and what happened inside. Uh, in the 14 years that he was in Guantanamo and things like this. And he also studied, mashallah, under Sheikh Muqbil. But the, the question he said, you know, when I asked him regarding what was so different that, uh, you know, different between you growing up and what you, what you see uh, with the youth growing up today. And he said, man, they taught us aqidah. This is one thing that they did with us is that that is the only thing that helped me no matter what situation I was in. It was always the, the, the way they taught us aqidah. You know, what do you, what do you think about his statement? I mean, what do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm smiling. I, w I was trying to hold it in. Well, I, I, some of the scholars that said aqidah, um, it is yeah, I mean, the same as tawheed and tawheed. Is the same as aqidah with tawheed, yani a am a khas min al tawheed, a tawheed a khas min al. I mean, we can go back and forth. Yeah, with yeah. That. no, no, that, that's but, not what but, I mean. But, but, I mean, but, but, but no, 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 no. I, I want you to understand it because I don't know what you understand about that. Some of them make a differentiation between the two, <laughs> but in reality, really, he it's the foundation. It's it. I mean, it's it's it, it's that which the people have left. That's mm -hmm. what Imam Malik said. Yani la yuslihu yani akhir hadi umma illa bima sala awal ha. That was Sahih. The day you accepted your religion, the day you accepted your religion, and you accepted it on your own merits and rewarded you with Islam. And the one who does not accept the Islam. فلن يقبل منه وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين كل no. هذا يشمل العقيدة في الله فإن الإسلام if we don't have that يعني in the scheme of things what Islam أخي so this is true أخي and you know we get blamed Wahhabi or you know these people they are you know, the terrorists no no no, no that's not extreme, even but the, the, the thing was uh, you, you see the thing was that at least what I was yeah, basically in one way referring to and and Jazakallah uh, for the clarification and uh, the one of the things was that you know at least back I guess the 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 people that came or at least in many ways people had wherever they lived they lived at least in there was a tradition and the culture of Islam people were surrounded in some way from you know with Islam. And maybe they, they didn't see the kind of uh, jahiliya that we see today. And so now when they when we see the children here in this country growing up and struggling, or we see them, you know, not praying. Just today, a brother told me, subhanAllah, after the khutbah, one brother came and said, listen, the my, my son keeps bringing, goes to Google, brings me these questions that says, what Allah, where is Allah? 
I've never seen Allah. And he's like, what do I what do I do to answer this question? And he said, I never had this type of questions in my mind. You know, it's not that I went and I studied for years and years, but brother, we never we never questioned these things. Yeah. And yeah. here I am, you know, I have I'm looking to find answers how to answer to my children. So is it because we we didn't we didn't focus on learning the deen the way we should have, and now we're suffering. And we just took the traditional and cultural Islam just by names, and now we are in a situation where we can't guide our own children. Yeah, this is this is what I meant, and I only referred it to uh, the issue that I did because you said this guy was from Yemen, number one. Yeah, no, no, I you <laughs> So, so, so <laughs> when we talk about those people from Yemen. Period. Not whether they study with Sheikh Mukbil or not. I, the no, thing no, that no, helped no. them is the Aqidah. That, that's just straight. You know, and yes. any other people, whether they're in Africa or they're from the people of uh, 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 India, you know, if, if they're people of Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith, and they were raised upon that, they have something to fall back on. Hmm. They have something that, you know, at the end of the day, they know inside, you know, I can't go on like this. I have to make toba. I want, I want, you know, so that's a beacon of light that is, you know, he spoke to that. And that's true because they were raised with Aqidah today. You know, after 9-11, really people are scared to even say certain terms. Jihad. I mean, the first jihad, you had enough. Uh oh, shut that program. Scared. Scared. <laughs> yeah, but people are afraid to mention, people are afraid to mention this, Aqidah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah right. you know, jihad is shaitan, you know, jihad against the devil, you know, himself, you know, whispering to make you do what's wrong. You see what I'm saying? So people are scared to mention terms, you know, so of course, they're not going to be equipped to teach their children aqidah, you know, and then when you took a business yeah. environment, you in the school that they tell you, you know, you were created from a big blast and the ocean and the, actually that's foreign to the, the weakest Muslim intellect. How is the yeah. child going to digest that and, and be guided? And if the parents are working 24-7, as we say, meaning most of their time, they're not educated themselves. Like that man say, what do I do? He has no answer. But someone who's raised in the house of Aqidah, if his child comes home with that, he knows what to tell him. Hmm. It's up to Allah to guide the child, but at least he has an answer for that child. Why? Because he has a foundation that he has learned from the teachings of Islam the proper way. So yeah, that brother, he, it, it's true what he said. You know, that people don't teach Aqidah no more. They don't have to teach it, you know, subhanAllah. So yeah. it's unfortunate, you know, but this is, this is the reality. And you know, when we talk about these children again, remember the time they live in. The Prophet talked about the holding of the hot coals in the hand. Actually, mm -hmm. we thought 20, 30 years ago we were holding the cold. No, these children today, they're holding the cold. They're holding the cold. I'm telling you, they're holding the cold. Yeah. They're holding the cold. May Allah make it easy for them, you know. And, you know, we'll lie in the, you know, in the end, only thing we can do is turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to help. But as long as they're in toxic environments like these environments that we're talking about, it's going to be hard. You know, mm -hmm. that, that because the character is suffering. This is the thing. You know, the character is suffering, you'll see. So we have to try to um, protect that character. But how can we do it again if we have communities that are fighting, communities that just want to make the five Quran, but the children don't know anything about that Quran that they're learning. They just sound good. Like music, yes. you know, or a nice yes. beat or, you know. But, for, uh, yeah. mention that. Yes, I mean, they're parents. Yeah. 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 And uh, so uh, you have just I, because I we have uh, time issues, but uh, Sheikh, believe me, this will, be, will not be the last conversation. Inshallah, this is the beginning okay. of a very long, uh, inshallah, relationship. But I wanted to ask you, you are running Marcus with Safina, you know, Safina yes. Tanu, a very yes. interesting name, Safina Tanu. Uh, I mean, <laughs> It seems like you are trying to raise up, uh, you know, a, a generation. <laughs> I, I, can, I can imagine the name here, uh, Safit, uh, Marcus okay. Safit. So, what's up with the name? And what very good, amazing name, by the way, very yani, mashallah. And what does the the Marcus do? Well, 
I, I'm actually, you know, a nonprofit organization. And, you know, the idea was something that became not just an Islamic um, idea to educate the Muslims and provide some services, you know, uh, in a mobile way as well as a stationary way. Mobile meaning travel around or by way of internet, you know, but also we wanted to deal with reentry people who come out of the prison, you know, to make a program where they wouldn't have to go to the church because they have to stay in the shelter or that the halfway house for them was ran by Christians, that we can develop facilities where they can, you know, learn Islam and come out of the prison to a semi-Islamic environment, you know, yeah. um, that we could deal with issues of uh, battered women and domestic violence. And, you know, we could deal with, you know, the issue of homeless and, you know, teaching people skills so that they could get some entry level jobs. And, you know, we had a list of things that we wanted to provide. And so we have those things now that we're trying to really uh, make them come alive. But initially, the idea was, as we were taught, you know, by many of the brothers who were in the Nation of Islam, they said they were taught, do for self. Do for self, meaning don't wait for a handout. So just coming back home from overseas, uh, you know, not really uh, being in the community at that time, as an imam, people wanted me to teach. And so my wife came up with the idea, you know, why don't you make something online and you can get some students you can teach online as well. And so, you know, we have this ongoing debate about what name, this and that. And so I mentioned an old statement that Imam Abu Muslim used to quote often. He said that Imam Malik, and I remember I went and looked it up, one of my books, that Imam Malik, he said, a sunnah, ka sunnah to nuh, wa man raqibaha, naja, wa man tarakaha, faqada, Okay, the hey, Sunnah I'm... is like the Safina of Noah, his ship. Mm. Whoever rides it, whoever boards it and rides, he's safe. Whoever abandons it, then it will be destroyed, or he will, yeah, he will drown. And so this is what made us, you know, pick the name, and then, you know, alhamdulillah, we just made it in the pronunciation way to be different rather than saying Noah's Ark Institute, but actually in the paperwork it says Noah's Ark Institute and then we have with the way you see it on the Facebook or YouTube M A R A K like it. So it is already an active organization is doing all these different types of work. Uh, so you are focusing on the brothers who are coming out of jails and things like this uh, to provide them with resources and services. Uh, ah, okay. So do you well, have well, a link well that 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 that's the idea. We actually you know haven't developed that stage where we have facilities, we have programs. At most, we do things on a um, crisis basis or we're trying to develop some type of curriculum and some type of joint effort between like-minded imams. But the idea is something that we have down on paper, something that is a service we want to provide. But actually having that as a organization we haven't really gotten to that stage yet but it's in the developing stages it's in the works inshallah yes in the works. so uh there, there are a few questions that we have to ask uh no. one of the questions is how do we how do you think we should proceed to try to fix this racist issue within the umya the educational process is always something that has to be um a round table discussion because the whole issue um, the effects of slavery and of course like you highlighted okay that happened and now the generation that we're dealing with now are different for example you know these generations muslim or non-muslims alike they typically don't have a problem with interracial relationships they don't but their fathers may have and their fathers you know but people need to understand the effect of racism the, the sy systematic you know, um, effect of it on whoever it is, whether it's African Americans, whether it's, you know, uh, people from the Asian continent, people from the African continent, because everybody suffers from it. The light-skinned African that has curly hair is not treated like the the, the, the dark 
blue or dark black African with 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 nappy hair. You know the 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 person from India who's dark and has you know straight hair is not treated like the one who's light skin has straight hair. We know that. You know mm -hmm. you know the color code that they put on this affects everybody. You know, but the education has to be there because some people think that that's deserving of a people because of how they look and that's not true and people have to also be educated to um some type of alternatives when it comes to those things that go along with that racism such as marginalization you know how to get around the marginalization opportunities how to provide more opportunities um some outreach you know where people can go and talk about when they have these issues and how they um, feel about these issues. You know, all of this has to be institutionalized in order to deal with the issue of racism. And of course, some type of economic base should be made where these people can have some type of economics because if you don't have economics in the world that we live in today, then you have no voice. Mm. If you have no so economics, you have no voice. Uh, the, the next question is, are you saying that to be respected as a person of color, we must work harder than, say, an Arab, uh, that we aren't at their level until we are educated? I don't think you said that, but that's a question. You know. I mean, yes and no. I mean, because if you take, for example, some of the issues that, we know what celebrities, you know, we see those people based on their color, they're treated one way, they're drugged down, they're railroaded, and based on somebody's color, he gets a slap on the wrist, it's not so bad, you know, and so that, you know, that whole idea, the caste system in India, mm. you understand yeah, that works similarly to, you know, uh, how things are ran in Western society, you see what I'm I mean, saying? Uh, so you know, mentality. Yeah, it got so bad in India. I just the other day I was uh, reading India today. It said that uh, they they had a 16 <coughs> 16 year old girl uh, was raped more than two hundred times. Ooh, the was more than, and just uh, because she was from a lower caste, uh, mm -hmm. even the police was in it. Uh, the the whole government was in it, uh, and she's Hindu, and she was two hundred different times she was raped. Uh, and this is so you're talking about oppression to levels you cannot yeah. even imagine. You can't imagine. You can't imagine. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, 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 the Muslim Ummah as a whole is going through what is going through. Uh, Sheikh, I mean, uh, does that, you know, I, I guess the role of the ulama also comes in here. I know, meaning that why are the ulama so quiet on oppression, Sheikh? And the type of oppression that's taking place around the world, why are the why in the world are the ulama so quiet? I and mean, what what they, they 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 what happened to the ulama? Well, I you know, I'm gonna be as we say frank. I don't know because I haven't sat and talked with people of knowledge, that the scholars even in America about these issues because it's a very touchy situation. Most people won't discuss it. Some people will deny it. Others will act too emotional where you can't get beyond the emotion. Mm. But I will say that. Again, when we talk about these issues of scholarship, then, you know, most of this racism is in their own country, in their own government, in their own families, you know, so they have a reason that they're not dealing with it. It's not because their eyes are closed and their ears are closed, you know. The second thing is that, you know, if you can't make a difference, our Prophet Salaam taught us, you know, to go to the next level. If you don't have the ability, and he only mentioned three things. Changing with the tongue, changing with the hand, the tongue, and the heart, hating it in the heart. And so when you talk about uh, this issue of, of you know scholars not being involved or not saying anything, you know, there's a lot of layers that should be peeled back. And, and, and of course, every scholar can't be um, accused of being silent in a guilty way because, you you know, if that person yeah, no, course, is yeah. not going to be effective, then, you know, but someone must stand up and speak. And I'm sure that there's somebody who has stood up 
and spoke against this. I mean, you know, because we don't know or I don't know, I can't see in the whole world. But as a whole, yeah, I mean, people are silent because, again, most people don't care as long as it doesn't affect them. You mm -hmm. know, as long as, um, you know, um, they don't have to deal with the backlash of that. Why get involved? Why? You know, mm -hmm. why? You see what I'm saying? And it's unfortunate because you even have some Muslims will say, well, Islam, you know, allows slavery. It's slavery mm -hmm. in Islam. I mean, I remember hearing a brother mention that and uh, back home in St. Louis, you know, and uh, Islam, yeah. you know. Just but, on but, that. But, but we know this is not the case. Islam so doesn't me, allow uh, now and it didn't allow slavery back. We have a we have a conference coming up in 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 a week. Uh, would you mind if you would you would you uh, uh, like to have uh, to speak on this issue? I, I want you to be able to come and speak uh, on this matter of slavery in the past and uh, in Islam. Is there slavery in Islam? I know we have a scholar who is speaking on this. I know, but his perspective might be a little bit different than what you know. I want somebody who is African American, a scholar somebody who has the qualifications to also come and discuss on the same thing to see where you're coming from because I want people should be able to see whatever sides you know not that the other brother is saying yes or no I just want to know if you have time yeah. inshallah, inshallah. When, when 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 is this supposed to take place 24 the 25th and the 26th he is speaking oh you are speaking it seems I didn't know that you're speaking already with us <laughs> yes brother Victor he wants me to talk about um uh, Okay. Uh, get yeah. Gaining justice through the Sharia. Good. Okay. Well, that's that's that that, that we can work on the uh, the topic. That's not an issue. One more thing, Sheikh. Somebody had a very interesting question. Do you see the struggle of Native Americans as similar to the to the African American struggle? Are they some similar? Of them, some of them say yes because not every person of color that came. Let me rephrase this. Not every person of color that is considered African American is African American. Some people, they were already here and they have the paperwork, they have the family members that are alive, they can tell them they were natives, they're from these people, we were here, we didn't come from a boat. And some people said that those people were already here and they may have traveled here from Africa way before the whole idea of someone coming with Christopher Columbus and all of this kind of stuff. But we will say that the slavery here in America on this land, it includes those two people, those that were brought from Africa and those that were already here. So the, the definitely the atrocities, the persecution, all of the things that you know um, we're talking about, we share in, except that this was really their land. Mm. Someone bringing you to a place is not like someone coming in your house and taking your house and your land. You know, so they have been done uh, a great disservice, a greater oppression than us. Although we share in that same experience, they have been treated worse. They have been um, dealt a a, 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 a eviler um, ordeal because they were here. This is actually their land. So, what do you have to say to 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 those Muslims and those scholars who promote Thanksgiving and and say this is we should be you know we should be celebrating this kind of holidays and things like this, uh, knowing what the struggle of the of the of the Indians or, or Native Indians, Sheikhi. Yeah, some people just want to eat turkey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so no, I'm not against turkey. Halal turkey or not <laughs> turkey, you know what I'm as saying? long as it's so, a bihai, you, know? <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, but well, lie, I did a talk in the message about um, this not long ago, and the reality is that many people don't know the history, and they yeah. think it's just the time because they they, they have shubhat. Nah. Just like we say, Islam today is um, one way. It was different 30 years ago. Now you have Wahdad, Adyan, United Religions, Abrahami. You have all of the Shubuhat. The same thing. They said Thanksgiving as we know it today. Meaning is different. It's just a time for friends and family and loved ones. But, Akhi, 
Mabuni al al-Batil to a Whatever was, you know, built and premised upon falsehood, it's falsehood. If I put on a dress, well, a wig and walk with a purse, doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not Jane because I, you know what, if you have a sex change, well, how are you going to be raised on the day of judgment? The way that Allah is, it was young created you. So, you know, that doesn't change the reality. You see what I'm saying? It, it just doesn't, you know, but at the same time, many people don't care to get a paid vacation, you know, mashallah, you know, you get to travel, you see family. So why mess all of that up, man? Be quiet, you know. But the reality is they're not, again, the African-Americans. They're not the natives. See, they don't feel the disservice the way the ones who are African-American and native who take that position. Because not every native and not every African-American thinks St. Louis is, you know, unorganic to us. They think it's, you know, hey, it's part of American fiber. How could you not? You know, mm -hmm. but the reality is, you know, celebrating the 4th of July, the same thing. How are we going to celebrate, you know, murder and massacre and rape and pillage? How? But people celebrate that because it's part of the American way. You're not American if you don't do that. And we're giving thanks. Are you serious? Allah mentions thankfulness and gratitude. So some people go there, but the reality is, you know, it's a old Christian religion uh, based um, uh, holiday. It was to celebrate that which is the worst nightmare for people that someone will come and take their land and rape them, their children and take their wealth and enslave them. So, you know, I mean, but there's a way to deal with that. No, I just like birthdays. There's a way to deal with that. You know, if someone wants to just have their own little gathering or, you know, well, lie, you don't get a chance to see your mom or your aunt except on Thanksgiving. Maybe you go this Thanksgiving, but next Thanksgiving, you purposely don't go, you know, and I've been in that situation where I believe you don't celebrate it. But because I hadn't seen my mom when she was alive, you know, and all of those years being in Yemen and Egypt, I went back to St. Louis. I was mm. there for Thanksgiving. I ate the food, you know, but, it's a break, they know right? I didn't, but, they, but they know I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm just here with you guys. Next year, don't look for me. I'm not calling you saying happy Thanksgiving and this and that because I'm here this year. So, you know, it's a way to deal with that. You understand? Mm. There is another question here. Let me uh, go. He says, uh, you know, how do you how do we watch out for our Nia? So that it doesn't get corrupted while seeking knowledge and some advice please because seeking knowledge to be respected is not the same as seeking knowledge for the sake of allah uh the brother he actually asked this question twice so i have to ask this question no allah most time well like that's an internal struggle mm. you know whether you're doing anything you know um seeking knowledge getting married um taking a job i mean and of course seeking knowledge is clearly ibadah seeking mm. a job or you know getting married some scholars they said you know seeking a job is either it's customary getting married either is customary you can turn it into ibadah but seeking knowledge is only one way it's ibadah it's something that's considered worship so you know from the beginning people have to be sincere with themselves you know if they know that i'm going to do it because i want to come back and be the man and, and you know on 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 the member or i want you know i'm going so i can come back and you know i can get four wives in the house and you know people are going to call me sheikh or i'm going to go and learn and i'm come back and refute all the people that you know they got this thing wrong i don't have no knowledge now but you wait till i get back then that person knows he's going to be ruined he himself has to fight that internal struggle you know but when we talk about the issue of seeking knowledge today like most people are doing it because it's fun it's something that gives you status it's something that will give you the edge over somebody who really doesn't have you know so each person has really got to you know go in a room by themselves and literally talk to themselves look in the mirror to make sure that they don't have any of those um, red flags if they find one of those feelings 
you know, if they find one of those issues of gratitude that, yeah, I'm going to seek knowledge or, yeah, I'm going to come back and do this, they shouldn't seek the knowledge until they purify that feeling, that idea from their heart and their mind. Jazakallah khair. Uh, one more uh, last question. Uh, it says, Assalamu yeah. alaikum, can you, can you talk about yeah. how you have seen how Islam uplifted or turned around a group of people? What should we continue to do to uplift each other in such tumultuous times? Well, in Islam is nothing but uplifting. And we'll find that the people are not uplifted by Islam. Then the Prophet he said, Wa man wajida khayran, Allah. Where it finds good, let them praise Allah. Let them give all of the credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. Whoever finds other than that good, let them blame no one but himself. So sometimes people, Islam is not uplifting. Islam is not you know, effective because of the level of sin. And this is one of the main points that we used to emphasize in the 80s and the 90s, and now in the 2000s, we lost it. The issue of ma'asi, sin. The issue of disobedience, the noob. The issue of, yani, kibaro, yani, the noob, yani, major sin. You know, a person will lie if this is their way, their Islam is going to suffer. You know, that Islam it has to suffer because just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't allow a person his you know, deeds to grow, your imam won't grow. So that's the first thing when we talk about, you know, seeing those people that have changed from the Islam is because they maintain by the permission of Allah, by his mercy and, and his, 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 you know, kindness to them, they maintain a type of Islam where they watch and they care about their deeds. They don't leave the five salat. That's a major problem for the Muslims that don't progress. They leave the salat. That's the only deed the ulama said that Allah Azawajal gave the prophet in the heavens. Every other injunction, he gave him in this lowly dunya, this lowly corrupt place called the dunya. As they said, the, the word dunya means lowly. But the salawat, and Khamsa, he gave it to the Prophet in the, from the heavens. So that Salah, many of the Muslims will lie, they left the Salah, or they're negligent in the Salah, or they pray only Jumu'ah, or they pray, you know, only when they go on Eid, or they pray only when, you know, somebody comes and says, let's pray. So that's one of the things, the people that you see, they have made progress in, in their Islam. They have made, you know, um, a, a significant change as a community or a people, number one is because they have maintained a, a, a visual watch on their sins. Number two, they have not left the salah. You know, they have not left the salah. And number three, I will say that um, they kept a balance. They kept a balance. You have to strike a balance between Dean and Dunya. And that's one of the talks we're going to do next week, striking a balance between the Dean and the Dunya. Inshallah, and with that, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, first of all, uh, Shaykhi, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, you know, take maybe 30 seconds if you can. Uh, just final thoughts on uh, an advice to the Muslims. Although it was that itself was an advice, but if you have something that you would like to mention as an advice to uh, all of those who are hearing, listening, and uh, it will be continued to be shared, Inshallah, all over in different platforms. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you if if you want a few words, Inshallah. Yes. I would say two things. One, I lost the vision five, six years ago due to glaucoma and retina detachment. I realized the blessing of having a certain level of the man. Because that which people see that lowers or even ruins their iman, I don't have that challenge anymore. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned if Allah chooses to test his servant, and this is a law servant, this is somebody who belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can test them how he wants, he can give them, he can pull back, 
if Allah decides to test his servant with the loss of his two loved ones. And the Prophet said, these two loved ones is not his two daughters, not his two sons, not his two parents, not his two wives. His two loved ones is his two eyes. And that person is patient with the loss of those eyes. They keep going on with their life. They have not lost the vision. The Prophet said Allah will replace those two eyes. That he lost with the Jannah. So my last statement of advice on this show for tonight is that people should not give up. Despite the affliction, despite the challenge, despite the everlasting long journey that looks like the road is not going to end and is narrow as it relates to our Islam and what Allah promised for the believers and what the told us if we hold to Islam, despite it looking like we're not there, we won't reach it, don't give up. Keep pushing, keep your head up, stay between hoping that Allah will accept and fearing that Allah might not so that you leave the sins and you do the good deeds and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وعد الله حق ومن أصدق من الله قيلا and Allah has promised is true and we will see it and who's more truthful than Allah no one else is وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبد الله ورسوله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير and thank you so much for having me on the show and um, I hope that I can be a regular participant in the show. And when all of this COVID stuff blows over, anything that we have in Chicago, I'll be more than honored to come, inshallah. Oh, for sure. First of all, Yanni, Jazakallah khair for your time, Shafi. Jazakallah khair for your, your time, your efforts, your, your knowledge, uh, your sharing uh, your knowledge and understanding with us. Because, you know, today, uh, uh, what we are missing are, are, are scholars. You know, for many people, it's very hard to get access to even scholars. Uh, and this platform, it, it, we are trying to bring scholars from all backgrounds and all, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sectors of knowledge uh, to share their knowledge with us. And, uh, you know, and wallahi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you, preserve you and raise your status Ameen. in dunya Allah, and akhira, uh, in order to continue benefiting the Muslim ummah. Uh, and dear brothers to, brothers and sisters, to all of you, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned, Fabi ayyi ala'i rabbikuma tukadibani. And subhanAllah, the Shaykh mentioned this, uh, saying that, look, uh, the two eyes, uh, Wallahi, brothers and sisters, how many uh, favors we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the two eyes, the nose, the ears, the lips, the tongue, the brain, the mind, everything that we have, do we use it uh, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or do we use it in the two, you know, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, these are all the things that we need to think about and Wallahi, that, that was a reminder to us that all of these factors, these resources given to us, what are we doing with it? How are we going to account for it on the Day of Judgment? Uh, so, uh, inshallah, brothers and sisters, Zakumullah khairan for attending. Uh, we hope and pray that you are uh, uh, that you are, uh, and also uh, we will just pass another uh, that Abu Talha. Many uh, brothers, you know, Abu Talha, Sheikh Abu Talha has been on the show many times. Uh, his his brother has passed away. Rahmatullah alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the highest place in the Jannah. Rahmatullah, as you know, he is an amazing Islamic economist and uh, he comes on many times discussing economic issues of Islam. So brothers and sisters, again, another reminder from what the, what the Shaykh reminded us, that we are not here forever. We will not be here forever. We were not meant to be here forever. We are for the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, 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 to give us the tawfiq to obey him and to go to our final home, which is Jannah. Please uh, continue watching this platform, inshallah. Uh, next Jum'a, we are going to start the conference. Uh, there's a huge lineup of scholars, humanitarian workers, uh, brothers and sisters from all over the world that will be on this conference, uh, they will be attending this conference. So inshallah. I come and attend bi'iznillahi ta'ala. And Jazakumullah khairan for watching. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair. Amen.
سبحان منزله بليلة قدره درب الهداية واضحات بياني يتلوه أحمد للدنا وهي التي عطشت لقطره هداية هتاني سبحان منزله بليلة قدره درب الهداية واضحات بياني يتلوه أحمد للدنا وهي التي عطشت لقطر هداية هتاني ربت به وزنت بنا زروعه حسنا وآتت أكلها بتداني لو كان أنزل فوق بود شامخ لرأيته متصدع الأركان